You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Yes, welcome again to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're glad to have you. It's a little bit different this week. Normally, we get to speak with someone for quite a bit of time to find out what they're getting up to with education and science. This time, it's a whole bunch of educators. Why are we doing that? Because coming up in the 4th of September for secondary schools and on the 21st and 22nd of November for its primary schools is the Youth Eco Summit. It's a major festival. It's been held for a few years now at Sydney Olympic Park, right in the heart of Western Sydney. And it's something that students can get heavily involved with. And it's all sorts of science around, the uh, well, environmental education. But it's not just about experiments and things. It's also how students can get involved in TED-style talks, student drama, film, music, all sorts of things. And if you're not in Sydney or the surrounding area, you can get involved through video conferencing as well. So everyone's invited, and it's a bit of fun. So... Throughout this uh, particular episode, you're going to hear lots of short interviews with all the different people who are in last year's uh, Youth Eco Summit. But if you want to hear about similar stuff for you know a bit of more of a deep dive, maybe jump back to episode 27 with Daniel Lego, who is the educator, the main educator for Sydney Olympic Park, talking about their environmental education programs. That was episode 27. And if you want to go a bit further in environmental education, maybe check out episode 25. We got to hear from Neil Bramson, the 2017 Prime Minister's Prize for Excellence in Science Teaching. He He's been doing a lot of work with the primary schools with his outdoor classroom ideas. And actually, if you're in the museums and zoo sector, maybe go to episode four of the Phys Ed podcast where we got to speak with Vanessa Parrott, who at the time was doing a lot of work on science festivals and what works and what doesn't, especially in outdoor settings. So I hope you enjoy this episode. It's a little bit different, but it's certainly going to be a lot of fun to get to hear from a lot of people. This is the Physics Ed podcast. I'm here with Holy Spirit and North Right. How you doing, guys? Good. All right, so we're down here at the Youth Eco Summit. Now, you've been going around to lots of different tents and seeing shows and workshops and things. What's some of the coolest things you've seen so far? Who's going first? You're going first, righto. Well, we've seen um, a lot of... Well, we saw some frogs. We did a silent disco and had a lot of fun. We put some wigs on. Yeah, that's good fun. So the silent disco was, was the origin energy, and we had Australian Museum, I believe, doing the, the frog survey. That's very much true. What else did you see? What did you see? Uh, I really enjoyed the silent disco. We're getting a theme here. <laughs> now, silent disco, what was that trying to actually teach you? Do you remember what they were trying to teach you? Oh, do you remember? They're, they're trying to teach you to save energy, but well, when, when you're doing the crane thing, you're, you're saving energy, like... Um, when you're when you're turning the crane, it produces natural. Energy. Yeah, so you're changing your movement energy, your kinetic energy, into electrical energy, which finally powers all the DJ stuff, which is really really cool. What else did we see? Oh, let's go over this way. Um, we saw like bones of birds and different animals. Oh, was that, was that over in that tent over there? What was that all about? Like, what was it all about? You want to go? We learned about mangrove trees, and we got to lick the leaves. Ah, so you learn about birds and actually how they could fly and what they're useful for as an ecological community. And you got licking mangrove leaves. Now, I'm assuming that's reasonably salty. Yes, very. Did anyone not like it? All right, so this, this is the problem with the audio. You can't see all the hands. We've got hands that said they would love it. I've got... It's delicious. Okay, the rules are that if you're licking a leaf, you need to know what leaf you're actually licking. So those people who are listening in on this podcast, maybe make sure you're with a botanist who can actually identify the correct thing. But um, certainly Abyssinia mariner, which is certainly all around through here. All these mangroves here, definitely, you can definitely do. All right, what else did we see? Um, I like the science experiment of how all the bubbles went everywhere. Oh, you're referring to physics doing some liquid nitrogen stuff? Yeah, yeah. We, I could say, full disclosure, the kids here just uh, watched a liquid nitrogen show and we just talked about climate change and talked about frozen bubbles, which is lots of fun. What else? Um, we learnt about the animals that lived in the mangrove forest. Oh, cool. What, mangro- uh, what animals do you find in this mangrove and estuarine area? What do you find? Um, ibises and sea snails and crabs and spiders. spiders. Absolutely. I actually had to do a mangrove uh, uh, crab survey once when I was at university. It's lots of fun, but also very muddy. All right. What else? Who else? Who hasn't said something? Yeah, what did you find out? Um, we learned that what I learned that what pelicans eat, they eat like snails and crabs and that if 
even the snails, like there was none left, then you could then the pelican would die. That would be so great for the pelican. What did you find out? Um, I found out about all the different types of birds and um, how there are different types of wings, like wings for flying, wings for camouflage, and wings to like keep them warm. That's right. That was with Bird Life Australia. They do a fantastic job when it comes to birds, and you can learn about how planes fly as we hear the plane going overhead as well. Very true. Over, over this way. I liked when we had to do physics education because the science was great, and um, I liked when he put well. Um, he put the bubbles and he took the bubbles out with the tongs and the ice bubbles. True. Now it almost sounds like I've had a plant there just to, to plug what we're doing, but certainly we had a lot of fun there. Very true. Who hasn't said something yet? Right, over here. I like doing the mandala artwork. Oh, that was with Botany Bay Environmental Education Centre. Now they were doing the science, the artwork with our like wood and banksias and bits. That's really, really cool. What else? Um, we learned that if one population of an animal in the mangrove forest falls then the other one that eats that will fall as well like generally so a lot of our fish populations totally depend on mangroves is really really important all right over this way oh actually who, who hasn't said something i want to make sure everyone gets a good chance all right over here they taught us in the mangrove tent that um the trees are wavy and like they weave through to get the sunlight Ah, right. So almost what you see, it's called phototropism, which is following the light. You see a lot with rainforest plants do that too. Over this way. Um, when we were learning about like the plants and how like the worms help the plants and um, like water, you put like water underneath the soil so the plants can um, suck in the um, water with its roots. So we've got Jenny here from the Royal Agriculture Society. It's been a flat out couple of days at the Youth Eco Summit. How's it been for you? Oh, it's been fabulous. The weather's been just glorious for us. The kids have been amazing. We've had such a huge number of kids, you know, mainly from Western Sydney, and they've just been here to learn. It's been great. So, look, you've got, I mean, it's not exactly a static exhibit. We actually do have, you know, cows here to show kids. I mean, what have they been most uh, interested in? Oh, look... You know, the cows are a definite draw card. You know, Queenie was, a, a you know, the star for me, a beautiful, beautiful, quiet animal. Um, but, look, it's actually the kids' fascination. We've also been grinding some wheat to produce wholemeal flour and then talking about what the difference between wholemeal and plain flour and, the, and you know, getting rid of the, the um, bran that's the outside. The kids have been amazing. The questions they've been asking and they've, like, aha moments. I love those aha moments when the kids go like, oh, that's what you're talking about. That's, that's great. That's what I love about what this tent's about, because to be honest, it really is the embodiment of paddock to plate. I mean, it sounds like a simple th- phrase to say on paper, but again, kids are really genuinely understand that, yes, our food comes from somewhere, and uh, yeah, seeing the difference is really important. Yeah, and I suppose what we really try and focus on is, look, it's pretty easy. It's very easy to ask Mr. Google, you know, where does that come from? But it's what actually happens from the farm gate before it hits their plate or the supermarket. It's all that process because that's where all the technology and all the, you know, where we really need some bright brains in the future to make it more amazing than it already is to feed the population. Absolutely. So as a population grows, they're going to need to eat. Like, this is straightforward. And, um, and also not just eat for the sake of it, like wholesome stuff and hopefully have less food mileage in the first place. Well, exactly. And that's the sort of things, um, you know, being the, the sustainability summit, really looking at that, um, the food miles um, that, that product has to travel and, um, you know, the sustainability of making that happen more eco-friendly. Fantastic. Look, thanks very much for jumping on, especially seeing that you're now starting to pack up the tent before the storm rolls in. <laughs> but, um, we'll, uh, I know we'll catch you again at the Youth Eco Summit. You guys have been a great supporter of this, and uh, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, Ben. It's been great. All right, so we're here at the Royal Botanic Gardens tent here, and uh, you guys look after Mount Annan as well. You've got a lot going on that way. Yeah, and Centennial Park. And Mount Toma. So you know, it's full size, isn't it? It's serious. It's pretty. It's pretty big now. Um, obviously we're here. You think we've got kids doing stuff now? Let's just describe what you guys are doing. Uh, well, over here we're uh, looking at all different kinds of seeds. So seeds that fly, seeds that dig, seeds that catch onto your clothing, and uh, how they get around and 
how our plants spread themselves. And considering the wind today, the dispersal mechanism will be quite pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I watch kids doing some craft actually with some um, paper to do that for the wing seeds. It's pretty neat. Yeah, making little paper helicopters because uh, for the helicopter seeds. And in your tent here, what are you showing over this way? So we're, we're looking at sustainable gardening. So we're looking at ways that schools can make their gardens more sustainable, um, looking at composting, worm farming, also water-saving techniques for the garden so um, they can go back and, and create some wonderful organic fruit and veg without uh, using too many resources. It always makes me interested about these sort of sessions because the kids get really, really excited about these sort of sessions and... Uh, they want to go home and make stuff. Do many kids come to you and go, oh, yeah, I've got a compost garden at home, or is it something new that I haven't heard about? I think most of these kids probably don't have one at home, which is a shame, but, but a lot of them, a lot of the schools are getting right into it at the moment, which is fantastic, and the, and the garden network around the schools is, is amazing. Some schools are doing a great job there. So, so a lot of kids are familiar with the composting and worm farming, which is good. No worries. So uh, what, what else is going on in the back there? So we've got all sorts of seeds here. I'm seeing hake here. I'm seeing... Oh, what, what's the one in the back there? I almost look like cocoa, but it's not. What is that? Yeah, it is. It is cocoa. Yeah, it is, yeah. So uh, there's lots of different seeds here and some of the stuff that is really interesting, like this stuff. So where chocolate comes from and all smelling all the different spices and stuff like that, you know, just to get get the senses going when you're looking at, at the world as well. Which is, their, which is their favorite one they look at? Oh, they're they all... They all seem to be interested in the spices because I think it reminds them of like mum's cooking. So they <laughs> they like they like uh, shaving the nutmeg and smelling the cinnamon and the vanilla. And then uh, I'm surprised that chocolate's still here actually. I actually <laughs> thought a kid had left it behind me. Can see what you mean? No, this is fantastic. And uh, look, you guys do a fantastic job. And if anyone listening has not been down this Australian Botanic uh, Garden, it's often missed. Like Mount Tomo's wicked as well. But often people don't realise there's a seriously important seed bank down there. Are you guys got much to do with that? Oh, not really. Um, sometimes, sometimes, because I do an outreach program, so sometimes when I'm out and about throughout regional areas, uh, I collect some seeds for um, some of the researchers, and, and they do a bit of work with those, which is always a lot of fun. And, and the students and the young people love getting involved in those um, citizen science type programs as well. Absolutely, and uh, you guys had a massive event with a Jurassic Garden only a few months ago as well, and uh, yeah, that was a uh, Really interesting, yeah. A good, good few thousand people rocked up down that way, which is really cool. And Centennial Parklands has a lot of stuff there too, especially with Lachlan Swamp. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a bat colony at Lachlan Swamp, <laughs> and uh, all kinds of things happen at Centennial Park. And nowadays we've got a wild play garden there, which is the latest attraction. So getting the kids uh, wet and dirty and uh, having fun digging and climbing and all that kind of stuff. So it's really good as well. That's what they should be doing. Yeah. Exactly, they should be doing it more and more of it. Hey guys, I'd love to chat more. I've got actually a whole bunch of kids lining up for another liquid nitrogen show for me, so I probably should turn up and uh, go do my thing. But uh, enjoy your afternoon. Yeah, thanks very much. See you later. <laughs> Kids teaching kids here at uh, Beresford Road and Botany Bay. Um, so basically, they're the experts, and they've been making some artwork, some nature mandalas, and we've got them doing artist talks to the kids from Plumpton and, and all the other visiting schools. Yeah. So uh, once the students have a look at the gallery and look at some samples, then they come out to these tables and they're creating their own artwork. Take a photo and then they could um, perhaps be inspired to do it back at their school. So it's a really good hands-on activity. Now, even just looking there, I can think I can see some coastal banks here by the look of it. I can't see the other bits. What are the other bits? Are you, uh, I'm guessing it's from your Botany Bay region, right? Oh, no, it's a bit of a mixture. Oh, right. um, some of the stuff's come from Kernel, some from the Blue Mountains. Yeah, some and... from my mum's place out at Orchard Hill. Yeah. She's even got her friends to collect stuff. So we've got pine cones and everything from... Uh, yeah, different types of leaves to feathers and found nature objects, basically. Yeah. So um, with a nature mandala, obviously kids love their art. I mean, how are you using that to be able to teach environmental messages? Ah, okay. So what the students at Burris and Road were doing, they were studying a geography unit uh, for stage three. And the unit was uh, about Asia and its neighbor, well, our Asian neighbours. What they did was they read a book called Elephants Have Wings and in there was a nature man, mandalas and so they were inspired to make nature mandalas and they used that as an idea to present here at the Youth Ego Summit. 
Uh, it's fantastic, and uh, you know, obviously, it's a uh, really highly engaging. I must say, it looks like you'd actually have, to have trouble getting the kids out of your tent, to be honest. <laughs> Well, it's amazing some of the kids ask you what the objects are on the table, so I don't think they get to play with uh, you know, seed pods and, and sticks and things out in nature enough. So the Youth Eco Summit is still running along. We're here with Venera from uh, NRMA, and you guys have been having a fun time down there. What's been happening down there? Uh, we've been looking at new technologies, new transport technologies, and we're actually telling children that flying cars are real and that in the next few years they may not be buying a petrol-driven engine, that they may actually be buying a car that's an electric car and that this car might actually be driverless. So what we're trying to do is encourage children to think about how the world is changing, what technologies are impacting on transportation and what that means about their future career choices, what subjects they study at school so they're ready for this new world. And considering well, you've got the, uh, the car down there, the kids have been very interested that the thing can move around and it's silent as a mouse, it's even silent too, but these things are real and they're coming at us very fast. I mean, and I love the fact that this generation is the group that will end up learning to drive on these things. Absolutely. We, we've got our electric car. It's not driverless at the moment, but yesterday I was at um, a, a, a pilot, a, a test run of a driverless shuttle bus that's being run at Sydney Pit Park that we're partners in, and it's truly amazing. You just sit in it and it does its own thing. It's got LiDAR and it's got uh, GPS to uh, very, very sophisticated uh, satellites allowed to predict its uh, space on the road to three centimetres. It's the new technology. At the moment, we're testing that with other partners. The aim is, of course, to bring it into an environment with real people and real cars and see how it goes. And this is the sort of stuff that's going to revolutionise the way we travel and the way we move from place to place. What I love about this is just how the safety aspects are going to be phenomenal. If you've got a million cars that are all networked up, that means they can talk with each other and protect their own environment. The safety is going to be very safe. And also from a sustainability point of view, uh, you'd hope that there would be less fuel being used purely because these things are far more efficient. Well, that's the, the thing is, we, we forget about the fact that the people that uh, drive cars on the road, us human beings, we're very unsafe. I mean, 97% of crashes, or thereabouts, are caused by human error. So we shouldn't really worry about machines uh, running roads for us because they're going to do a much better job than we humans are doing. So we're going to have safer roads and we're going to have cleaner roads because in Australia, transport emits 13% of all uh, airborne uh, pollution and gases. And even just the family cars, about 8%. So we're breathing all that, and people are dying prematurely from the really dirty environment that we're living in. Uh, this is fantastic. And this is why having NRMA is, you know, helping out the, with, with the Youth Eco Summit. It's been so important. I mean, you are in the precinct at Sydney Olympic Park, but very much you are the heart of the motoring group right across the state. It's fantastic. Oh, we love, we love being in the education team because we get to talk to children and also to adults about these new technologies. Most adults are really focused on the here and now and they don't really know what's around the corner. And around the corner are driverless cars, uh, car sharing. The way in which we tra transport ourselves is going to change dramatically because Sydney is gridlocked and we need to find a new way. We're heading towards what they call Carmageddon, which is cars just stuck on the road going nowhere and we're trying to do our bit to change the way people think about mobility. We don't need to own our own car to get where we need to be. We just need to have access to someone else's car, a car that's on the road 24 hours a day, working rather than sitting in our garage for 22 hours a day and we're paying heaps of money to keep it there. Yeah, it seems nuts and to be honest though I love the fact that we've got some bright minds looking to do something about it and not just talk about it, actually enact things that actually mm. make it real which is fantastic. The students are terrific, their ideas about the future and how this is going to impact on them. I think that primary school children are so open minded when it comes to new technologies and they're really thinking about the what if scenarios and I think they're really commendable. All right, so I'm about to do a liquid nitrogen show with, uh, is it plumped in public we got here? Sure is. All right, so what have you guys got to do so far? Um, we have oh, we've um, painted ourselves with um, Aboriginal paint and sharpened some rocks. 
That's down with the Marama uh, thing down on, on the other side, isn't it? Yes. What other stuff have you got to do? So yeah, you can, I can see you're covered in paint with uh, all from the different clays and things like that, all the different ochres and things. What else have you got to do so far? We got we got to look at cows. So that's with the Royal Agricultural Society. You got to look at cows. What did the What did you learn about the dairy industry there? Um, cows make milk. They do make milk. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, so did someone say something about about bees? Yeah, the about what happened bees. with the bees? We learned about native bees and um, how they help like pollinate things. Yeah, what did you make? The sea bomb book. Yeah. Ah, awesome. Next, now you guys are out of Plumpton now. You're out in the Cumberland Plain woodland area, so there are a lot of native bees out where you are. Very, very much so. Um, uh, Miss, how have you found this today? It's been really good. This is my third year here, and it's it's very valuable for the kids. And considering that Youth Eco Summit has only been going for a couple of years, that would make you a veteran. Pretty much. <laughs> you're calling me old. <laughs> no, no, no. It means that you're experiencing. You know what you're doing here. Now, I know that you guys have been involved, and actually we are... Um, and having the, the, we've been out to your school with the GWS Giants as well, and you, you guys have a lot of fun with that stuff. And um, look, speaking of which, I really should start doing some liquid nitrogen because we've got a hot day, and I'm watching these clouds come on in, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what's happening next. So anyway, let's get going, guys. We're going to play with some liquid nitrogen. Are we cool with that? Yes. yes. Right, we better get going. Yeah, the sun's coming down pretty hard now. Now it's about lunchtime. The kids must be really happy with your positioning. Yeah, it's a really nice shady spot and we're near the cauldron. So every time the wind blows that water across, we get a bit of a, a nice cool shower. Early uh, yesterday morning for the first day of the Youth Eco Summit, I saw a school sitting too close to this <laughs> to that cauldron. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, those people listening, uh, the, where Cathy Freeman stood for the 2000 Olympics, where she got Rose up to you know, light the fire... Well, it's, it's up on a stand here, but it's all that they've turned it into a bit of a fountain, and every now and then it, it rains on you. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So uh, what have you been doing with the kids at the Eco Summit? Well, today our focus is on sustainable houses, and we're actually talking to the kids on how to have a sustainable house. So talking about um, uh, renewable energies and how we can keep our house cool, uh, different ways using uh, solar energy and, uh, you know, keep it switching off our our PowerPoints when we're not using our appliances. So quite a lot of things, and it's quite interactive. The kids are helping us actually design the house. We have we have it there on boards, and the kids come out with their little Velcro pictures and they stick them in, you know, use your curtains rather to keep out the sunlight rather than, than put on your air conditioner to keep your room cool. So lots of different ways of, you know, making your house more sustainable. Sustainability has been a big thing in primary education for a number of years now and definitely the fact that you're doing it out in the open. It would just be interesting as groups come through, are you finding that kids very much know what you're talking about or are you having to teach them right from the start? Oh no, the kids are really cluey about sustainability. I think teachers um, are teaching them in their classroom. It is part of the syllabus now. So um, yeah, they, they're pretty good and some, of the, and some of the kids are saying, oh, we have um, a solar heater on our house. We have solar panels in our house, you know, and we have a, we have a rain tank. So, you know, I think even uh, parents at home are, you know, now starting to think more sustainably and it's good to see. Absolutely, I and mean, especially I mean, Australia, it's got a lot of sun. <laughs> it's massively so. And it'd be actually interesting, like, we've got listeners all over the world, and I noticed that actually I saw some people actually in Iceland are listening. They've got a different you know, headspace around how their sustainability works because, hey, they've got geothermal and that type of thing. Each, each to whatever you got around the place, right? Yeah, that's right. So we talk to the kids about us, us having a very hot climate, and, you know, often we have a cycle of drought. So, you know, to conserve water and why that's important. So, yeah, that's right. Oh, fantastic, and um, I'm sitting in your tent here out of the sun just for a moment, and we've got a number of our fauna specimens here, and I guess it's the sort of thing you would see at Observatory Hill, right? Yes, these are some of our Australian animals, and we've got a collection here, and we've asked the kids to come in and have a look and, and see if they can identify which of these are not Australian natives, and it's interesting, uh, we've got a tawny frog mouth here, yeah. and uh, the kids think it's an owl, a lot of uh, kids think that's an owl, so that's the tricky one. And they, some of them have picked that the Indian miner is not native. So, yeah, they're pretty good. They love the animals. So, I mean, I mean my biology is a little bit rusty these days. But I, am I looking at Rattus Rattus or Rattus Fuscapans or something like that? What am I looking at here? Yeah, so we've got a native bush rat here and we've also got a black rat here. So the black rat's not native. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, and another thing I wanted to mention too that the kids have been doing too under our tree is at the end of the workshop, we're actually giving them um, an iPad and we're using a design in house app and we're asking the kids to actually design a sustainable house. So they actually create the rooms and then they furnish them and, um, and they've really enjoyed that as well. That's really cool, especially when the kids like not quite understanding that insulation and double glazing is just as important as you know putting solar panels on the house, especially uh, in our climate for sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's right. We've got um, Barama, who are a part of the Youth Eco Summit. So it's like a, one of those songs where you've got this featuring that. So this year we've got the Youth Eco Summit featuring Marama. And Marama is a youth Indigenous summit. We've been in camp now for a couple of days with uh, about 50 young Aboriginal uh, students from uh, secondary schools around Greater Sydney and from ACT, learning about culture, connecting to culture. Uh, and as they're doing that, they're now given in the Eco Summit an opportunity to shine, an opportunity to share that culture um, with uh, primary sco- school students in a kind of a kids teaching kids model. So, yeah, it's worked out really well. No, it's been brilliant. I've been seeing kids all with uh, ochre across their bodies. I've seen a lot of uh, learning how to use the woomera to throw spears. I mean, there's a lot of science, but also I just love the fact that kids can connect with their culture. They live, you know, in this area. Yeah, exactly. Look, it's very curriculum-based, and um, most of the students who are delivering these uh, these cultural activities wouldn't know that um, because it's, for them it's culture but yeah science technology you know social technologies of indigenous culture are in there as well but we've had art we've had dig and dance we've had um, uh, song lines storytelling oral histories weaving string making um, and um, and look a lot of fun besides oh, it's fantastic look uh, Mike you and the team at Sydney Olympic Park have put on yet a fanta- another fantastic show we've kept the weather away for maybe another hour or so and uh, look you've got to get going because they're about to do a full ceremony for Marama. I can see yeah we're, we're finishing up this afternoon after a couple of hard days work um, but um, but you know we're as the t-shirts say standing tall walking strong and uh, thanks Ben appreciate your support here too mate we've had a blast take it easy All right, so I'm here with a great mate, Emo, from the GWS Giants. We're here at the Youth Eco Summit. Dude, love your work. What have you guys been doing today? Today's been running around. I'm just checking out the workshops. We've got today about 500 students that we've brought in, if not more, from about five different schools. I'm just giving them that opportunity to be involved in what I believe is the best event of the year. Yeah, you guys are full on. You're like the, the hidden infrastructure that makes an event like this run. Like it wasn't just today. Like how many schools did you bring in yesterday? Uh, yesterday, again, I think we had about nine schools involved from our end, uh, 1,200 students or so. Um, getting involved from all Western Sydney, we have schools from Grey, Greystain, uh, Bankstown, we had schools from Plumpton, um, uh, Claymore, all over the place, and the private and the public se- sector, um, all to get together um, for an extremely important cause, which is the environment and sustainability. Exactly right, and uh, you guys do a fantastic job when it comes to promoting the environment, sustainability, and really science in general. I mean, love your work. Um, so what, what, what do you got do, doing for the rest of the afternoon? You get to kick back and relax, or you got more stuff going on? Kicking back and relax, I don't think that exists in any of our vocabulary. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> what, what, what is this thing you say? <laughs> Speaking a different language. Uh, no, we're just making sure everything's running smoothly, keeping our schools happy, making sure um, they're at their workshops at the right time, um, uh, their buses are good to go, um, all that behind the scenes stuff that... Uh, doesn't get any glory to it, but makes an event happen, I guess. Uh, seriously, without you guys, an event like this wouldn't happen. With you and the, the team at Sydney Olympic Park, you're kicking it. And uh, and those people who are wondering, the GWS Giants, I know that we've got people all over the world listening. They are a major sports team in Western uh, Sydney. And I'm um, only a hop, skip and a jump away from Spotless Stadium. In fact, I can see it right now. Okay. So if you happen to go to Sydney and happen to be around during the footy season, go see the Giants. Look for the uh, orange and grey. And uh, those guys do a massive job in the community. They're fantastic. Not as good as the physics team does, trust me. Oh dear, oh dear. Here you go again. (laughs) Thanks very much, Matt. Have a great day. Have a lovely day. Thanks for your support, Ben. Okay, so we're in the last few uh, few moments of the uh, Youth Eco Summit. I'm just here with the Australian mu- mu- Museum. People are trying to pack down their stuff and I'm harassing them. But geez, you guys were busy with your uh, events. How'd you go? 
It was awesome. Um, we had a lot of interest from the children about the live frogs we had here and also about the new app that we've just launched. And we're hoping that we get a lot more people uh, making recordings of frog calls and taking an interest in the local frogs and their environment. I love it because that's very much citizen science and kids just love this and being involved. Tell us more about that app because, hey, I'd love to know more myself. Um, okay, so it's a free app. You can download it for iOS and for Android. And all you do is you download the app. You go out to anywhere you think you hear a frog, including your backyard or the local park, or you can go anywhere in Australia. You, If you think you hear a frog, you open up the app, you press record, and then if you take a 20-second recording or more, then you will get an option of frogs that are near you that it might be, and you can take a guess and think of which one you think it might be, and you hit submit, and then it goes to the Australian Museum, and we check it out, and we go, yeah, you did a good job. That's exactly the right frog. And then that can be used for distribution and population data, and we can do all sorts of wonderful things with that information. That's awesome. And you weren't just promoting your app. You actually had live frogs here. I'm we looking did. around. What do we got here? What, which ones have we okay, got? These are Frog and Tadpole Study Group of New South Wales frogs, and we've got Latoria cerulea, which is the Australian green tree frog. Um, this one is Godzilla. He's 25 years old. And green tree frogs can live for up to 35 years. They start off really tiny and they grow and grow and grow for all that time. So they're really spectacular frogs and everyone in Australia loves a green tree frog. Sadly, not as common in urban areas as they used to be. They used to be very common in urban Sydney and now you only see them in the outer suburbs. But they're still pretty common right across Australia, except in Victoria and Tasmania where it's a bit cold for them. Um, we also have the most common frogs in Sydney. We've got the Perrin's tree frog, Latoria perrini, and the striped marsh frog, which is Limnodynastes perrini. And lots of things named perrini because Francois Perron was a famous French naturalist and he discovered lots of things and lots of things are named after him. Um, but that's the most common tree frog and the most common ground frog. And today we've been telling kids um, how to tell the difference between ground frogs and tree frogs by looking at their feet. So tree frogs have special toe pads at the end of their toes and they can use that to climb vertical surfaces like your letterbox or your window and the ground frogs have long slender toes and they burrow into leaf litter or some of them even fully underground. Now, do you have kids sometimes just come in and just go, oh, I can't look at frogs, I'm scared of frogs, I don't want to touch a frog, or are they pretty chilled out with it? Okay, some kids go, oh, I think that frog's a bit scary, but most of them we win round. Yeah, it's good. And actually, being in the heart of Sydney Olympic Park, we are very close to the green and gold bell frog lair, which is just around the corner here. Yep, we brought some green and golden bell frogs. We're really lucky to have them. They are not doing well in the wild. It's wonderful that there is a sanctuary for them here at the Brick Pit at Sydney Olympic Park. And they are surviving in some of the ponds around Sydney Olympic Park and in other areas, but they're only isolated breeding populations left now, and it's not looking good for their future. So we're very, very excited to have them here today, because for a lot of people, this may be the only green and golden bell frogs you ever get to see. That's true, and I suppose it may, maybe the most likely way they interact with it is actually through the app, perhaps, because they'll be able to hear it rather than not see it. They will be able to hear it, and we're really, really lucky with the app because we've got frog calls on the app, if, even including some of the extinct species in Australia. We were really lucky that people made those recordings before the frogs completely disappeared. And already, in the first couple of days, we've had frogs that there were no recordings of the calls available. We had people going out and finding them for us. So there's a couple of species from the Northern Territory that there was no recording and someone found them and said here you go you can use this recording so it's been really brilliant it's amazing how much people are getting behind this that's uh, a win that's a total win hey well done i know you've been very very busy with this and um i should leave you be it's friday afternoon let's try to pack up and run away oh we got someone else to say something yes if you want to find out more about the Frog ID app, please just go to the Frog ID website. So either Google Frog ID um, or go to the Australian Museum website and you'll be able to find the uh, website for Frog ID, which has all of your download links, teachers' resources, everything you could possibly want and more information on how to get involved. There you go, everyone. you got homework. All right, have a great afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So with Kate, it's the last session we're all dealt with. Pretty much all the last kids just jumped on the bus from the Youth Eco Summit. My gosh, I don't think you got a chance to even get a drink or a food. You're flat out, Kate. Oh, by the way, Kate is from the Taronga Zoo, and uh, my gosh, it's somewhat popular. It was very, very popular. I had four animals, and the animals all loved meeting probably a few hundred kids. <laughs> 
and then some. <laughs> That's true. Um, so what, which animals did you have? Because frankly, I couldn't see through the uh, throng of crowd. <laughs> so I had a possum, a ringtail possum, and I had a blue tongue lizard, a spotted python, and a, ooh, now my memory's, <laughs> a white-lipped tree frog as well. So four and, all together. And this is the thing about uh, the four animals. It's always hard to say which one's the most popular because as you bring it out, every kid's just going to go, whoa, each time. Which one tend to be like, wow, just generated the most questions? Yeah. Well, this one is always a winner it's always a favorite the snake so the kids were calling out snake 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 and I'm so glad I brought a snake because they were very excited <laughs> luckily the spotted python is a nice introductory like it's a nice introduction to snakes some of the kids had a few fears but um it was really nice to see them face their fears when they all touched the snake and they were very very interested asked lots of questions about them and about the snake and the other animals as well but yeah I think the snake is always a fave <laughs> Absolutely. Now, um, did the kids actually, when they were interacting, for example, with a snake or not, were they uh, concerned whether it was carnivorous, whether they ate plants? Did they have a bit of an idea about its biology, or was it really their first time they'd ever come in contact? Yeah, so um, a whole range, range of kids. So there was kids, I noticed, that came down from the Blue Mountains who were telling me that um, they see these kind of animals, so snakes and lizards and possums, in their even in their backyard or around their school grounds. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them had stories for me about what they saw and um, venomous snakes as well. But... Um, um, then there was other kids who had never met any of the animals and it was a completely new experience for them. So it was a good range. Um, yeah, and I guess I just worked worked around that. That's what uh, the Youth Eco Summit's all about. Is uh, yeah, Kids actually teaching other kids also in yeah. some ways. And to be honest, having as much variety as possible in something like this is fantastic. And the fact that you guys could come on down for this day is just brilliant and much appreciate for coming along yeah thank you it was awesome it was a really good experience lovely to meet yeah lots of very very excited kids um and yeah i think the animals will have a good night's sleep tonight except for the possum who'll be running around all night <laughs> yes they do that very much so but hey you know that's the thing they are you know crepuscular they, they do you know hang out at night time and uh, that's their thing you can't change that yeah that's right yeah cool right. well hope you had a good day too uh, it was good fun you're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Why don't you book us for a science show or workshop in your school? We love seeing students get excited about science, and you will too. Go to physicseducation.com.au and click on Schools for more info. Well, there you go. That's a Youth Eco Summit. I hope you enjoyed just hearing just a short selection of the entire offering at the Youth Eco Summit. And I really hope that if you're in a secondary school, you can pop over for the 4th of September. And if you're in a primary school, pop over on the 21st and 22nd of November. It is well worth your time. And as I said at the start, you can get involved even if you're not in the Sydney metropolitan area. Definitely so. So definitely just go find out. Type in Youth Eco Summit into uh, Google or your favorite search engine. Just type in Sydney as well. You will find the Sydney Olympic Parks page and you can find all about it and how to sign up for your school. It's well worth your time. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. It's a little bit different as I said at the start. And we're going to go back to our normal programming next week with some more interviews with some top science educators. But until then, I hope you're making your classroom, your zoo, your aquarium, your museum, wherever you happen to be teaching science, as great and as vibrant as possible for the learners that you've got on hand. You've been listening to me, Ben Newsom from Phys Education, and you've been listening to the Phys Ed Podcast. I'll catch you next week. You've been listening to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. This podcast is part of the Australian Educators Online Network. AEON.net.au